Welcome to Buckets. My name is Matt Moore. I'm the senior NBA writer for the Action Network coming to you from our Tommy John's home studios. This is your NBA futures guide for Monday, as well as our best bets episode for Monday in the association. The future Jays are back. Jim Turvey no longer has some sort of ridiculous wedding or NBA, WNBA finals game and or cricket match to go to. Joe Delera ha- is wearing an action uh, quarter zip, I, I believe. Yep, it's a quarter zip. Uh, instead of showing off his massive guns that he usually is on the show. That's how you can tell the weather is getting darker. This is the Future Jays episode with Joe Delera and Jim Turvey. You can find both of them in the Action Network app. Best way for you to track your picks, check out a pro subscription. You're going to get all sorts of cool stuff, like the, our pro signal system, which tells you. I like it because it's it will first tell you, hey, the money's coming in on this. So, like, big money is being bet on this. And it will also tell you sharp action, which is, all right, look, at the books that we track this at, there's been significant moves at these books in this direction, which indicates a sharp group coming in and betting on this game, as well as you can track your own system plays in there. You can follow all sorts of stuff. Uh, Brandon Anderson had a great day betting NFL. Um, not as good Ooh. as me because I went 6-0, and but he had like a really good day. So 6-0? and what were, the, what were the six? Uh, I had... I'd forgotten because I'm mad about my NBA bets. Uh, Cleveland, <laughs> what they got from Raybon, Chris Raybon oh. in the Action Network app. Uh, Indy plus six and a half. And then, <laughs> and then Anthony Richardson got hurt. And I was like, Flacco time. And I live bet the Colts. <laughs> and then Richardson came back in. And I was like, oh, God, no. But it cashed <laughs> yeah. anyway. Uh, I had the Patriots plus seven. Pretty much everyone in the known universe I was, was on you, that. Because... Did you do money line or no? Just the plus seven. Just just the plus seven uh arizona plus three and a half Woo! you had a uh, day <laughs> and i uh, also day. was able to get home on denver minus nine so uh all right this is we're, we're gonna get into every week here on the monday show the future jays breakdown we look at the market we look at some changes uh i put together a handy dandy new spreadsheet that actually pulls in the odds and creates a log for us so we can look back and see where the odds were and where they are we're gonna tell you about some of the most notable moves that we've seen in this first not even week, just like five days of the season and some indications that we've got. These are very early leans, and I was not expecting to have bets. And then Jim came in and just fucking firing, just like. So I started I blasting. Didn't we give best bets for? So I came with five futures bets and, oh, really? and had to scramble to get a Monday bet in. <laughs> yeah, we will also do Monday best bets for you as well on today's show. Make sure to check out YouTube.com slash The Action Network for all of our great video podcasts. All right, let's start here. Uh, let's start with rookie of the year because I think this is interesting. There is not a single rookie who has, is averaging double digit scoring right now, so that's fun. Yeah. Uh, I do also enjoy the fact that uh, Jamison Battle of the Toronto Raptors leads with nine points per game, and then my guy from Toronto, Jamal Sheed, I is second. Sheed. I love Sheed. Eight point seven points, four point seven assists. It will not hold in any way, shape, or form. I was but trying to third. talk myself into his odds somehow, and I was like, nope, that's stupid. Nope. <laughs> don't don't do that. <laughs> Uh, but third is Eve Misi. It's awesome. Which sounds like a Pokemon, but is actually a center <laughs> for the New Orleans Pelicans, uh, who was drafted in the first round, highly touted uh, center. And Jim, you don't think that there's a lot of value there, but you do think that maybe it's something to watch for in the future? Definitely. I think this is the number that if you, you had to be really quick because this is the name that has popped as kind of the really big mover, you know, to start the season, I don't think too many people were logging Eve's Misi rookie of the year bets. If you were honestly pretty sharp because there was a path to getting minutes. We talked about how the Pelicans are going with their, you know, extremely non-center century lineup. Um, and there is a route to him, to him getting minutes and it, he is, he has produced so far now because the odds have, cut in so much already he's down to like plus 1400 which you know, there's it's still a long number but at this early in the season you would be chasing the massive move that just happened so I, I i would not go after it at that number but i do think it's very telling that he has stuck himself in the race why i'm interested in rookie of the year is i think that zach Eady still the favorite should not be the favorite i you know i came on his podcast we were talking about the futures and i don't follow college basketball i, I admitted it and i said I feel like I'm taking crazy pills because for years people told me this guy was a dinosaur. He was not going to fit in the NBA. He was way too slow. And then suddenly it flipped and everyone's like, this guy's amazing. He's going to win rookie of the year. I think it's the answer somewhere in between, but I definitely don't think he is by any stretch like a runaway favorite for rookie of the year, which the odds got down to, you know, in the preseason. And even now as the favorite, he's either struggled with conditioning, foul trouble, or just not being super duper productive in his game so far. And, you know, he'll improve as the season goes along. But 
I don't think that he should be the favorite, let alone like a pretty healthy favorite right now. And whenever that's the case for a market, I'm always going to be looking at names further down down the list because when the favorites misprice, that's that's gold for futures. Joe it is okay if you do not have thoughts on this, but I want to get you, get you, get before Jim gives out two more best bets on an absolutely ridiculous team because he's backing the just the most ridiculous Southeast Division teams this year. I did want to get a sense from you of uh, if you have any thoughts here on the Rookie of the Year. Right? Yeah, I mean, look, I think that Misi, uh is has been really solid, but I agree with Jim. Like, you just can't be chasing steam right now. I will say that uh, you know because it's kind of ambiguous in terms of who is going to be good or who is going to really get a lot of action. There probably is still like, you know, maybe some meat on the bone with grabbing the guys that were at the top of the draft, honestly, because you can kind of see that uh, like Risa Shea is getting pretty good run with Atlanta and Atlanta is running like this really rangy, like long team. Um, and like they're, it's a high powered offense. So like, if you're looking for something that's going to put up counting stats, I don't, I don't think it's that crazy to say like, Hey, like I'm just going to go with, the, like the top guy in the draft i'm gonna take Risa Shea because like right now uh it is early and like jim said if people are chasing steam and, like Edie's a top 10 pick but i agree like he hasn't really looked it right now um but it, it's definitely a wide open race there's definitely gonna be a lot of value to be had and i think there's gonna be a lot of buy opportunities for guys as the season goes on um all right the, let's let's give jim's first and then i will i'll circle back with a guy that i like uh jim you, you like a pair of Zards here. I do. I think the Wizards have made it abundantly clear that for, for once they are finally leaning in and they are doing this all about the future. They had the, the starting lineup with the average age of like 22 and a half years the other day. I, this is, they are going full future mode. Um, right now, Alex Sar is second in the among rookies in terms of field goal attempts. I think that will almost certainly end the year that he will be top among all rookies in field goal attempts. They're going to give him the ball. They're going to let him do his thing. He's, he's second in points as well. He's going to rack up rebounds, assists. He's just going to be out there. My guess is he will lead rookies in minutes. The, he's going to get every chance. Joe mentioned Risha who I, I, I like him as well, but he's a little bit shorter odds. He did just get his first start for Atlanta, but there's more mouths to feed Atlanta. I think Atlanta potentially is going to be competing at least for a play-in. The Wizards are just like, we are going to give every minute to every, you know, top pick that we can and see what we have here, which is why I also, so SAR is at 10 to one. I think that's kind of a crazy number to, to be out there right now. So among the favorites, SAR is definitely my favorite, but Bub Carrington on the wizards has also getting, get, getting a lot of the ball, getting a lot of minutes for Washington. If he can stay healthy, he's already got, you know, picked up a tweaked ankle here, but he got a start as well. Um, and again, he's just going to get so much of the ball on this wizards team that is thankfully just going to le- like leaning in at this point and saying, it's all about the youth. They're going to play him, these two guys along Koulibaly. JV's moved to the bench already. They're just like leaning into it. With rookies, it's really about the the PRA. Basically, a full season PRA, you want that that's where you want to be. Sar has the, you know, the reputation as a top pick as well. So, uh those those two wizards because they're just so obviously leaning into the bit at this point are are my two favorite bets right now in the rookie of the year race. So two names I want to talk about, Dalton Connect uh, with the infamous Lakers bump, shooting 50% from the field. Connect on October 14th, so as we were about, what, eight days from the start of the season, uh, was all the way down at 1,500 was the best. 1,600 uh, was the best number that you could get him, and he is currently uh, 600 at some books because, well, he's playing minutes for the Lakers and he's hitting shots. And that will do it. Now, uh, I am kind of curious on y'all's thoughts on this based off of the idea of like, well, okay, look, uh, there's a 650, by the way, in the market. There's a 700 is the best in the market at, at several books. I'm kind of curious as your thoughts on this. Typically, if somebody starts this hot, right, it's like, oh, this is a good opportunity to go the other way. Like with Zach Eady, right? Mm-hmm. Like, oh, he's still at the top of the board. Let's go the other direction <laughs> and go diving. But if Connect were to like, because I'm like, well, come on, he's not going to shoot like 50, 40, 90. And he's not, but if he is playing a major role and he is getting more minutes on the Lakers and he is on national TV a hundred thousand times, that's going to be a, I think a pretty good case. Uh, Joe, is this like a, are we willing to like lose the moment here with Dalton connect here with the Lakers? Or do you still think that there might be a better moment for, to buy, to buy in on him later? If he's a guy, I mean, I think like if you're going to bet on anybody on the Lakers, like I, I think if connect is like really good and the Lakers are, that probably means the Lakers are also going to be really good. Um, 
if you say Brawny, I'm ending the podcast. <laughs> I, I mean, to me, it's to me, it's more of a like, is this a co- is it a coaching thing? Like, because it, it's the roster is exactly the same yeah. as it was last year. Like, it's literally the same besides like a couple like random little pieces. So to me, like if 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 JJ is able to get like a lot out of uh, Dalton, if he's able to get a lot more out of this roster, um, that's that's probably the way I would look at it. Because like I don't I don't think that connects numbers are going to be good enough like no matter what that they're like popping off the page so it's going to have to be like a narrative it's like oh like he's contributing to a real to a winner and that's just not what we've seen win rookie of the year so like i i I, to me like i'm okay like passing on him um i i I just don't need it like it's awesome if he's great like he's got a cool nickname and everything but um i i don't need a (laughs) i don't need a position on him the gentleman I will be betting uh, after this podcast, however, it will be my, I guess I will go ahead and label it as a best bet here. Uh, I'll be grabbing some Donovan Klingon at 20, uh, there's a 30 to one at Bet Rivers. I'm going to grab him. Um, every indication that the Blazers are going to give him a lot of, like he is, he's not playing a ton yet, but there is like every indication of like, wow, he's really good. Like he looks to me like a guy that's going to get a lot more minutes. And he looks just absolutely awesome and he's grabbing rebounds. And so I'm just going to, I'm going to go ahead and grab Klingon at 30 to one over at Bet Rivers. Um, so Jim, Bub, Bub, Bub Carrington was like very highly regarded in the draft. Um, and Sar, are you at all worried about the fact that they can't, you know, score? That- <laughs> I will say so, but here's the thing. So you mentioned Dalton Connect. And in his great shooting, Alex Starr right now is averaging more points despite shooting about half of what, <laughs> almost literally half from from two and three as what Connect is shooting. Now, part of that is that he is a very bad shooter. That is an issue. But I do think the two will come to closer together and it will make Sar average, you know, around 10, 11 points, Connect more like six, five, six points. So I, I do think Connect is a 10 times better shooter and Sar has shown an ability to put up some really bad shooting numbers, but... I don't think that they will stay at below 30% and below 20% for the full season. I, I could be wrong I, though. I am hoping that, that Carrington wins out though. Cause I just really want bub as a rookie That's of the cool year. Name. Like just <laughs> bub. We need more bub in our lives. Um, <laughs> let's talk most improved real quick. And this is mostly a me segment. Uh, Kay Cunningham went from 1800 or better. There was a 3000 best um, to plus 1000 or better. 1200 is now best. And that to me makes a lot of sense based off of the fact that, uh, I think, you know, Cage just has really popped the opening schedule for the Pistons has been just a nightmare. They've, they've faced Cleveland and Boston. Um, and I forget who they fa- faced on opening night, but it was rough too. Um, like they've just faced yeah. like a murderer's row to start. Oh, the Pacers, and right? They looked okay. Do I, I? They played the Pacers on opening night, right? That's right. It was the Pacers. That's right. And like they led and they led going into the fourth quarter and then the Pacers were like, no, 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 no. So, um, but they, they hung like they, when I, I bet on them for the over 25, it was built a lot of like how they've looked and Kate has been putting up really good numbers. Jaden Ivey has also moved from 60 to one to 40 to one. I'm not willing to, to go ahead and say that these are a best bet, but I did want to kind of note that like, I think Cade, it's like, well, Kay was the number one pick. We've seen those guys get this. Like, we've seen consistently these top three picks actually be the ones that have won in the recent years. So this isn't surprising to me. Cade is like, yeah, he disappeared. He, he underperformed, and then he lived up to expectation, and that jump is what they're rewarding. I don't think that's a great way to do it, but it's what they are. Like, the most yeah. improved player right now is Jay fucking Huff for the Memphis Grizzlies. Like that, <laughs> that's that's the most improved player. But they won't. They won't bet Jay Huff. Wah, uh, they wah, won't... baby, another UVA player in the league, right? Um, Lamelo Ball is the other name I would go to. Uh, he went from thirty-five to one or better to twelve to one or better, and Lamelo looks like he just looks phenomenal. So now Charlotte's off to not a great start in terms of the wins, but he but Lamelo looks, and he is a guy that I think is when I started to, when I looked at him and was like, all right, let's do what we think about the award and what we've seen through these first couple of games. Lamelo is a guy that I'm like that makes perfect sense. Again, a top three guy, highly regarded, turns the corner in terms of, and people hate this narrative of now he's winning, right? If they start winning games because he's playing better, if they start to actually win some games, he's learned how to win. I actually think that that's true. I think you have to learn how to win in the league. Okay, Matt, I have a really quick non-betting hot take 
I want to roll it out and get your your take on it as well. I think the Hornets are a top three league pass team right now. When you combine the announcers, the court, the uniforms, Lamelo, and the fact that it's crazy high pace every game, high scoring, they're close games. Top three is a little bit crazy. If they're in the West though, and they got to play all these fun teams, and you got to see them that way. I think they'd be a lock for it. Where do you have them in in your own rankings? They're pretty high. I would say that they're probably top ten yeah. based off of the uniforms announcing and general style gets them very high. And then like they play yeah. a fun appealing, like Charles Lee has them playing a fun pace and they are competitive. So as long as they're competitive, yeah, they'll, let, they'll plummet. Like, <laughs> That's the thing. The, yeah. Well, the best is the best, is, the best teams are the fun, bad teams that cover. Yep. That's like, that's the, that's the sweet spot for NBA league. It really is. And so I'm with you. I'm with you in that regard. Uh, let's talk six man of the year. So I actually want to talk, I want to go to Joe. Because Joe has a has a pretty strong take here on a Boston Celtic and a possibility of him being a best bet for us soon in the future. Yeah. So in the long shots pod before the season, I gave out Peyton Pritchard 100 to one to win six man of the year. And we're all the way down to 22 to one. I honestly I still think there's a little bit here because he is just getting burned and the dude can score like all he does is score. And he's put, and he keeps making these crazy half court shots. It's so it's insane. like, like I know, I know the one he made the other day didn't count, but like the three quarter court one. But he did, like he keeps doing it. And I think he's getting a lot more visibility. And as Al Horford gets older, like we are seeing that, like this rotation is like thinner. Just it's just generally thinner. And Pritchard is a guy like they they had these comments before the season started. Like Jalen Brown made like they were they were honestly like kind of they were kind of crazy. But like he was like <laughs> yeah like. When we pay like, like the Pistons and the Hornets. Like we're just going to let like Pritchard go crazy on him. And that he literally is doing that. Like that's what he's doing like every game now. So Boston wins these games by so much. And I know like the beginning of the schedule besides the Knicks, they just kind of got, you know, they got lucky against the Knicks, but um, the, besides the Knicks, right. They, <laughs> <laughs> the start of the season for them has been like a little bit light. Right. Um, in terms of like what the expectations for or were for the teams that they played and Pritchard's just gotten a ton of run. Um, and he's putting up like 15 points every game. That's exactly what you're looking for from a six man of the year, except that Pritchard also, like if they do rest guys, Pritchard's a guy that puts up, like sometimes he, he can put up like a triple double. Like it's not even, it's not even totally out of the question for him. So for me, I like, I think that he's going to be, he, he's going to be in this conversation because to me, like honestly, like the difference between him and miles McBride is not super significant. And McBride's 10 to one. Um, it's like, he's this microwave scorer off the bench that can actually run the point if he has to. And he's playing on the best team in the league. So he's going to get a lot of looks as a guy. He's going to, all of his advanced numbers are going to look good because he's playing alongside of like Tatum, Brown, Drew, Derek White, what poor Zingas, whenever he comes back, Horford. And the number, like the hundred to one was crazy. And I still think 22 to one is a little bit long because he's just, he's never going to start. He's only going to start if there's injuries. And like, we know he's going to be stuck in the six man role. Some of these other guys, like I don't, you don't always know. Like sometimes they get so good that you have to start them. And Pritchard is just never going to be in that scenario because of just how good the Celtics are overall. I'm surprised that I, I will probably bet this Pritchard thing. Cause you know, like it's tracking like your logic on it's very sound. 22 to one's a good price. I'm just a little surprised. Miles McBride's moved from 16 to one to 10 to one. And he's like the darling of our entire slack. <laughs> um, so I'm just a little bit surprised that you're not in on miles McBron deuce. I love deuce. I love deuce, but I just think the number, like the number just doesn't make a ton of sense. And then also like, Josh it makes Hart. a lot of sense if you understand how many goddamn Knicks fans there are. <laughs> yeah, but the, sadly, but, our but the slack is, is not the voting population. But the thing is, though, McBride is like close. Like Hart can come off the bat. Like you could rotate them around. Like who knows? Like what the rotation is going to be. If somebody gets hurt, McBride's starting. Like there's just not even a question about it. Like he's going to start. Whereas I don't necessarily even see. I don't think that that's necessarily going to be the case with Boston. Like I don't know if Pritchard would always start in the events that like some Celtic gets hurt. They have, they have a couple other options. Like if it's a big, you're going to run maybe like a Hauser or not a Hauser, but you may run like Cornette. If it's like Tatum, you might run Hauser, like somebody like that. So, whereas with the Knicks, if a wing goes down, McBride's probably going in. And then like that might blow up the bet in and of itself. So, um, and also like the price is just 
like double for Pritchard. So uh, I'm, I'm more comfortable with the 22 to one, even though I love Deuce. He's awesome. So another name that one, no, no, I should have just transitioned from the Hornets to this. That was a bad job by me. I should have just done the transition. Uh, I did hop on with preseason. For, I think it was Fonseca. Uh, somebody in our Slack was like, Trey man, six man of the year. And like, I noticed like he was playing really well and shooting the lights out in preseason. But I was like, all right, but let's see the actual season start. Yeah, no, he's averaging 18 per game on 40% shooting from three. Good enough for me. I'm in on Trey Mann. I got a 30 to one. You can still get 25 to one or better. That was definitely part of my best bet here. Um, I, look, Jim talked about like their style, their open style of play. I think the Hornets will be competitive. And if they're competitive at all, like six man should really go to somebody that's in the play in tournament. Like that's like the perfect way to do it. Like, oh, you're not quite in the starting unit for a team that's not quite in the playoffs. That's like the perfect way to do it. So I really like Trey Mann um, at 25 to one still. He was 80 to one in preseason because most people have no idea who he is. Um, I really liked him last year and they really liked him after the trade. They're, the organization's very high on him. Like they, like this is not like a, huh? Like they're genuinely like, no, no, no. We think Trey's a guy. Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm in on Trey Man at 25 to one now to win Six Man of the Year. Um, Jim, I actually I'm, I'm I am pivoting here. I want to give you just I need a 30 second cap from you. We're not going to react to it. Give me a 30 second cap on um, DPOY. Why you think Wemby? <laughs> why think Wemby is very clearly overrated um, as a topic in our Slack. Um, but why you think Wemby's overrated, and where do you want to bet instead for this award? Well, I think he is overrated for this award because I don't. I, I think it's you know it, it's very early in the season; things can change. But it looks like asking the Spurs to have a top five defense is going to be a very big ask this season, and that has pretty much been a prerequisite for this award. I think there's two really interesting names that are just beyond that tier. Wemby was, I believe, a minus number before we started the season. He's already yeah. to a plus number, so I think people are realizing that. The two names, Evan Mobley and Anthony Davis, they're both sitting, I think, AD, the best number is 11 to 1, Mobley at 14 to 1. Mobley has looked amazing. My only worry is that he might split votes between himself, between awards, because he might be both most improved player and defensive player of the year. He might be up for both those. They're playing a little faster, so the steals and the blocks are up for him. He just looks phenomenal in general. The, the Cavs' defense has, you know, again, we're talking tiny sample here, but it doesn't look like they're slipping at all. They're third best defense um, by dunks and threes this season already. And then the Lakers are a little bit lower. They're seventh. But Anthony Davis, again, there's even some, you know, Anthony Davis MVP buzz. I think that's probably a little bit early on that front. And with him, the biggest thing is always health. But narratively, he sit, fits so well. We talked about this on, on the Futures pod before the season. He's a generational defender who's never won this award. I think it's really easy. You know, he made the comments after the game the other day. He might start pressing for it. He said, you know, he had the little, the little dig at Gobert about his block on Gobert saying that's a defensive player of the year award type play. You know, if, Le, if the LeBron machine gets behind him, it's L.A. You know, there, there's a lot of roots to him getting this award, a lot of paths to him getting this award. Yeah. So with me being a little bit lower on Wemby for this award, with just the, the Spurs defense aspect of it, plus his blocks are down. I do think that, that people are, you know, the, the fear of Wemby has already kicked in and we might not see the five blocks per game that he was being projected at. It might be more like two and in, insane fear that, that doesn't lead people to, you know, go at him. But these other two guys are going to be, you know, steady, you know, two, two steals, two blocks and top 10, maybe even top five defenses. So I think both of these guys have to be in consideration right now for DPOI. Yeah, there's been a lot of talk about like this awesome start for the Spurs defense and about how great it's been and putting out some team wide numbers. Um, yeah, so I looked it up this morning with Victor Wem and Yama on the floor. They are 17.1 points worse on defense per 100 possessions. They have a 118.4 defensive rating with Wemby on the court right now. That's crazy. Like, Kiddo is a little bit lost. And, like, he'll settle in, and he's still going to be amazing. And, like, Wemby's awesome. And I'm not, like... You're never going to catch me being like, actually, he sucks. I hate those kind of takes, right? (laughs) But... The idea of like Victor Weminyama is why the Spurs are good defense. Like it's just not true. It's just like it's not true if you watch the games. It's not true if you look at the numbers. Like that's just not the case. So there probably is value elsewhere. Speaking of Anthony Davis and the Lakers, and I will say that Jim's absolutely right here. If let's uh, let's just put it this way: if Davis plays like this for seventy yes. games, he's winning. Oh something. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> like most valuable Laker, they'll <laughs> they'll fucking invent an award to give it to him. The Bronze so, so, most valuable Lakers 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 Lakers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Lakers might sweep the awards. Um, <laughs> but the other impact here is something that Joe kind of wants to talk about, which is 
All right, they're off to this awesome start, 3-0. They look absolutely phenomenal, look like a changed thing. I was talking to Tony Jones of the Athletic last night at the Lakers game, and he is, like, raving about one J.J. Redick and the yeah. coaching job that he's doing, making Jackson Hayes look like an NBA player, the ATO sets that they're running. It's like a nerd basketball hoop fan's dream. So, Joe, uh, Redick is obviously going to be a very, very heavy favorite in this market, but do you think that there's still value on him? Yeah, I mean the the mark the the narrative is there, which I think is super important, right? Like he's the guy, like he's going to be under a microscope this season, and like to start the year to have this like kind of conversation around you already, like there's buzz saying like, is he going to win Coach of the Year? Because like he he's just been out there, like all his podcasts were out there, like you knew that he was a smart basketball mind, right? But the biggest thing to me is like. This Lakers team is exactly the same team. They're literally the exact same team. And I mean, like, aside from maybe like the vibes around like having Bronny there and like maybe that like helps the like the vets and just like it makes it puts everybody like in a little bit of a good mood. Maybe puts LeBron in like a little bit of a better mood. Like it's worth it then, right? Like from a 55th pick of the draft. But the thing when I'm watching the Lakers is like they're running legit like offense and they're running set plays. And I think that that is super, super valuable for this Lakers team that's a little bit older because they need, like, you don't want D'Angelo Russell, like, ad-libbing an offense, right? It's just, like, <laughs> like it's, not, it's not a good formula. So the windup is that LeBron, or, like, LeBron really was running the entire thing. He was, like, creating the plays. He was running the offense. He was ad-libbing. Like, he was creating off the dribble, whatever. If you have real set plays, that makes his life a little bit easier. It takes a little bit of the wear and tear off of Anthony Davis. And, you know, you can actually get some action. You can get more out of your players. Like, Rui Hachimura looks incredible. Probably because they're running some actual actions for him. Um, and they're, like, I saw one play. They, there was a clip on Twitter, and it was, like, there were, like, 12 passes in five seconds. When was the last time you saw the Lakers do that? <laughs> like, never. Just never happens. Maybe twelve dribbles, but not twelve passes. Um, and that's, I think, a, a huge, huge difference for them. And the other thing that I like, honestly, JJ, right? Like when the game gets a little funky, he just doesn't care. He's like, I'm just going to spam LeBron and Anthony Davis pick and roll, and like you have no answer. There is no answer for it. So I'm just going to keep doing it, and that forces defenses to do other things. So I, like, I think that the hype machine is there, and if the Lakers are even like if the Lakers are like firmly in the playoffs, like not like not a play in team, if they're say like a top four seed, I, I think Reddick probably wins this award. Yeah, I wanna I'm 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 gonna wait. I'm not they they had to come back from double digit de deficits in back to back games. Yeah. So I'm very curious about Monday night's games in particular with this. Yeah. I wanna see how that one goes. Um it's going to take me a while to get on board and the value may be gone and I'm okay with that. But speaking of coach of the year, Jim, you want to double down a little bit on our preseason pick. It was yours. And I jumped on board after you convinced me. And that's Kenny Atkinson, who's still at 15 to one when he was 30 to one in preseason. You still think that there's value on Kenny Atkinson? I do. I think I do. Like I think that JJ has rightfully moved. I mean, we talk about all these line moves. JJ is now tied for the favorite for this award. And I do think that there's, you know, a fair amount of, of logic to that if they overperform, by those 10 wins we always talk about, you want to overperform your, you know, preseason expectations and last year by 10 years, 10, 10 years, 10 wins, they'd be in that like, you know, mid to low fifties uh, win total. I think that's very viable for, for Lakers. So I, I think that's a fair favorite to have in the market right now. However, I think that doubling down on Kenny Atkinson at, he's still out there at 15 to one. I still think that's a, a pretty good bet. I'm kind of surprised he and Boonholzer, Boonholzer is now down to 10 to one. I think the Cavs have looked better to start than the Suns. The Cavs have kind of, you know, done everything that we thought their new coach would do, but it's looked smooth. Whereas the Suns have done everything, but it's looked a little clunky at times. Um, the Cavs, you know, like I said, they've maintained their top five defense. The offense is in the top half of the league. They're they're running with pace. Evan Mobley genuinely looks like he is a better player right now. I think that is definitely Atkinson has kind of unlocked something there. They if they can be healthier, we talked about how this team, you know, they miss so many players, and the fear was, you know, they they kind of played better when they didn't have all their players. But logically, if you have a good coach you want your players to be healthy. And now I think they have a good coach. If they can stay healthy in the East as is, especially with those, you know, some of those already, some of these East teams looking like they're going to just hand wins out. I, I think mid to low fifties for these, this Cavs team is very feasible. Um, you know, it might have to be like 56, 57. Um, but I really think the ceiling is there for this Cavs team. If they stay healthy all year and, and Atkinson is, is going to get a lot of credit for that improvement. 
Uh, I want to put Jamal Mosley on the watch list for Coach of the Year. Um, I was watching Magic Clips this morning, just went through, and I'm just running through all of their offense. It's different. It's just they've added a lot more actions and spacing. Those guys know where each other is, and so they're reversing the court. This is like one of those little tiny basketball nerd things that is a very big deal to someone like me. Jalen Suggs moving to point guard. Here's something that Jalen Suggs is awesome at, reversing the floor. So when Suggs drives on the left side, he's able to get under the basket and kick it all the way back out to the right side wing. And once you do that, that defense has already moved in to collapse on that drive. That opens up the perimeter and generates better looks either from three or for a pump fake and drive. Paolo looks like an absolute monster in some of these sets. They're generating catches for him where he's not just having to grab it, hold, 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 and do mellow stuff. It's like it's out of actions to get him in opportune situations to do it. Like Mosley's offense is maximizing the talent that they have, which is why you're seeing a big bump in their offensive efficiency. It might grind down. That's why I'm not betting it yet. It might slow down. They might just start missing more. Like that's the thing is you can create lots of really good looks, but if you don't hit them, it doesn't matter at all. That to me though, I think is, is a guy that I want to keep an eye on for Jamal Mosley for coach of the year. Um, Joe, you have a note in here for MVP, but we're going to skip it. I'm going to make that's people fine. wait. We can come back. Week. We'll come back. We're going to, we're going to, there's, there's time. It's not going anywhere. I don't think. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think so time. either. Hopefully not. Um, Cause it's already a pretty short number, but we'll talk about that <laughs> next week on the show. All right. From our Tommy John's home studios, let's do Monday best bets in the association. We'll go around the horn, give our best bets, and then we'll give the handicap. Uh, let's start with Jim Turvey. Jim, what are your best bets for Monday? Following up my coach of the year with Cavs plus three. Okay. Ooh. Joe DeLera. <laughs> uh, I'm on Jalen Duran over 22 and a half points plus rebounds against the Miami Heat and Christian Brown over four and a half rebounds against the Toronto Raptors. All right. I am going to be on the over on Rockets and Spurs based largely off of that conversation that we just had about how the numbers are not good defensively with Victor Wamanyama on the court. Um, yeah. So let's go ahead and go to Jim Cavs plus three betraying your beloved Knicks <laughs> and Jim's beloved and Joe's beloved Knicks and Chris Baker's beloved Knicks and uh, Malik our editor's favorite Knicks. And uh, there's like on, a 1700 and on, and on. Just everybody and on and on <laughs> Watts too. Uh, so give it to me. What's the cap on the Cleveland Cavaliers? Yeah, I mean, the look here for, for early season stuff, it, I really am still in the point where I'm looking for teams that I, you know, I'm, I love a, a future. The reason I'm on the future Jays is I, I, I think in futures very often. And this is a team, I wanted this head-to-head -head season win total so bad. I never was able to find it. But the Cavs are a team that I have been high on all offseason. I think that they're being undervalued in the market. Knicks are a team that all over their unders. Uh, sorry, Joe, again, we've, we, you've tried to talk me out of it many, many times uh, over text, but I, I do think that there is a depth issue here for Knicks. We've seen the Knicks twice. We've seen they've looked terrible. They've looked amazing. Uh, Bridges has looked like he's lost. Then he looks like he can't miss a shot. So the Knicks have been very noisy to me, but the, the Cavs have been so steady that I think we're, we're going to get a, the Knicks are due for a close game here, right? That they've had their you know, a big blowout win, big blowout loss. I think this one's going to be a really close game. So I do want to stay on the spread here. But the, to me, the Cavs are the better team right now, even even with the Knicks, you know, as as semi healthy with with no Mitchell and no uh, Precious. But I want I want the Cavs going into the Garden um, and getting those that plus three. There's if if, if it can last there, the, the, the three versus two and a half is definitely like a notable thing. Um, but getting Cavs plus three is a number I like for Monday. Two and a half, the uh, most common line last season was two and a half. So um, it's not a key number, but it is pretty common. So I wouldn't be surprised if it just kind of hung and stuck there. Uh, Joe, I am just kind of curious. Do you feel good about your Knicks in this spot? Uh, I mean, I think it's a tough matchup. Um, Brunson hasn't performed great in this spot against Cleveland. Um, just I think it's tough for him to get into the paint. It's tough for him to get to the rack. So we probably need a little bit from everybody else uh, in order to win this game. I, I think it's a, I think it's a tough spot. And like, you can definitely see that like the Knicks, the Knicks put it to the Pacers, but um, you can see that there are certain things that like aren't smooth yet. So with Cleveland, like Jim has kind of been saying, they're a team that's bit there. They're the same core. It's just new coach kind of like smoothing things out and they've seen really like instant improvement. So tough spot. Um, but, but Go next. <laughs> Based on, I will say it's interesting. Total on this game is two twenty two. Based on last season's numbers, I have this at two seventeen point um, nine. 
So I've only got it. I've got 4.1 points under. And the problem I have here is I think that the Knicks and Cavaliers are both more than 4.1 points better offensively. Well, there's the pace for the Cavs and there's the cat at the five for the Knicks. So <laughs> I agree. Yeah. yeah, I'm probably going to stay away from it. I just, I, you know, that over, I think, is very tempting at a number 222. Anything south of 225 is. I want to see if Atkinson, away. you know, my, my coach of the year here, if he can, the Celtics were kind of tormenting cat as as they, they were they were so happy cat at the five yeah. i want to see if we get some of that stuff uh on monday jared allen doesn't offer the exact capabilities um at the, as maybe some of the celtic centers but um i, I do think yeah. that that is a definite defensive liability for the knicks uh that they'll have to figure out at some point um rockets i think have underperformed a little bit offensively so that's part of my cap here is i just think that they're gonna probably bounce back based off of last year's figures i've got this at 228 and i still think that's probably pretty close mm-hmm. now spurs like like I said, the overall numbers for the Spurs defensively are good. I'm just not sure how sustainable some of that is. Like if Wemby's on the floor for the majority of minutes and he's giving up a 118 offensive rating, are you really going to be able to get the kind of performance that you've gotten defensively from the bench so far? Or is that shooting luck? Now it could be shooting luck the other way in the Wemby minutes, and that's entirely possible. But I do kind of like this matchup. There's a lot of guys on the Rockets, I think, that are getting quality looks and they're just kind of settling in. Um, They still have a lot of offensive firepower. Jalen Green's actually playing really well. And so um, with the way that this kind of matchup goes, I'll take the over there. I do have one more overplay, which is I also want the over in Jazz Mavericks. This is just, this is entirely a Mavericks offense play. So I, I actually will probably wind up on Mavericks Jazz over and a Mavericks team total over because it's mostly a play on Dallas's high powered offense versus Utah's bad defense. And I think Dallas's defense is still looking really good, but Honestly, the Jazz are pretty stable in terms of just putting up points. So I'll play both probably with a heavier play on the over total and then a smaller play on um, Dallas team total over as a kind of a safety valve for me there. Um, Those would be my two plays for Monday. Joe, what's your best bet in the association? And give me the handicap. I like Jalen Duran over 22 and a half points plus rebounds against the Heat. Uh, The biggest thing for me here is that, you know, Bam is obviously playing the five for Miami. And as good as Bam is from a defensive point of view, he is not somebody that's necessarily going to take it to you on offense, especially now um, in get Jalen Duran in trouble uh, with all the other options they have in Miami, but also he's not like the best rebounder. Um, It's not that he can't be a good rebounder, but it's just that that's not really what Miami has him do. Um, And Jalen Duran has played extremely well against Bam uh, going over this line in four of five games uh, in like head to head matchups where he's played his typical allotment of minutes, basically 30 minutes a game. Um, And when we look at Duran so far this season, he's basically played 30 minutes in all three games so far for the Pistons. I think that his floor for his minutes is pretty solid. Uh, Even if we filter by 25 minutes or more, when he's played 25 minutes at least, uh, he's hit this line in 83% of games over the last, uh, like this season and last season, uh, averaging 27.8 points plus rebounds. Um, I just think this number is way too low. And honestly, when we look at that chart, it's even crazier because most of the games are against the Cleveland Cavaliers. <laughs> those are the games that he misses in. He just, it's, it's, a, those, that's a tough team. That's a tough team to do that against. Uh, but he's gone over this, like I said, in four or five against Bam over the last, uh, like a year and a half or so. So I like Jalen Duran over 22 and a half points plus rebounds against the Heat. Um, and then for my second bet, uh, I like Christian Brown over four and a half rebounds against the Toronto Raptors. Um, Brown has seven and seven rebounds in Denver's two games. The biggest thing for me is that uh, he looks like a ball hawk. Like he is all over the floor. And that is just like, he knows what his role is. And he is hustling like crazy on every single possession. And his, like his conversions on like his rebound chances is a little high. Um, he's had nine and 10 rebound chances. So, but even then you're still assuming about a 50% conversion rate. And that's just like for an average player, um, the way that he's playing and like what his role is, he is just attacking the rim, like with ferocity in terms of getting these extra chances, whether it's on the offensive glass or stopping some defensive opportunities there. So for me, just based on what he's trying to do or what the role is, I think that there's a little bit more upside and then we've seen it now through two games. Now we look at Toronto, Toronto is not 
uh, a super like strong team. I don't think this season. Uh, and I think that there's going to be plenty of opportunities for him. I think it's a decent matchup wise, like personnel wise for him as well. Like there's no way it's going to really exploit him. I think on the offensive side of the ball. So I, I like Brown over four and a half rebounds in the spot against Toronto. My only warning for you is that the Raptors are currently second in offensive rebound rate this season um, behind of all teams, the Charlotte Hornets. At yeah. 41. It, I will um, say, I think part of it has to do with the fact that they played the Sixers and Drummond immediately got in foul trouble. Like he was in foul trouble in the first mm-hmm. two minutes. Um, and then he was in foul trouble the whole game. So, cause I bet on him and I was so mad because he just didn't play any minutes. <laughs> so, like, so I know exactly why <laughs> the rebound rate's so good. Cause yeah. then the Sixers yeah. obviously had nobody else to put in at the five. They put in Yavaselli and like, yeah. we know how that went. It's also, yeah. it's also, it's also three games. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's three games. Yeah. So, no big deal. All right. That's going to do it for buckets. Thanks for joining us. Jim Turvey is on Cavaliers plus three. Joe Dallara is on Jalen Duran, 22 and a half points and rebounds versus Miami. And Christian Brown over four and a half rebounds. I've got over in Mavericks, Jazz, and in Spurs, Rockets. I will probably also give in and bet the Pistons in this game and hate myself for it is what will probably happen. Uh, We'll be back tomorrow night with more best bets here from the Tommy John's home studio. My thanks to David Payne, our producer, as well as Hutton Jackson, Tito Bonach and the video crew getting us up at youtube.com slash the action network. Download that action network app. Give us a five-star review. Feedback's a gift. We'll see you guys again tomorrow. Until then, let's get buckets.